The NHL has a lot of logos, jerseys, and teams that never were. The Quebec Nordiques 1996 proposed rebrand, the mustard yellow Dallas Stars jersey, the Hampton Roads Rhinos, all things that didn't make it past the prototype stage. Perhaps the most infamous case is the St. Louis Blues alternate from 1996. At a time when alternate jerseys were just reaching the NHL, we all saw everything from mascots on jerseys, to gradients, to what looked like cartoon characters. Nothing was sacred on an alternate. Not even traditional horizontal stripes and basic censored logos. The NHL's third slash alternate jersey program began in 1995-96 with five teams. Pittsburgh's was popular and would go on to become their eventual dark jersey, but the other four were widely panned at the time. Los Angeles and Anaheim would drop their alternates after that very season, while the other three would carry them into 1996-97. Five more teams were set to wear third jerseys the next year. Of note, St. Louis is among them. Reported to, quote, incorporate their trumpet shoulder patch as their main logo in their alternate jersey. That's where the truth becomes a little fuzzy. Mike Keenan was the Blues' controversial coach slash GM at the time, and it's been said that the only positive thing that he did for the team was prevent the Blues from wearing said alternate jerseys. Of course, this ignores the Krister Olsen for Pavel Dimitra trade, one that would very, very much help the Blues, but that's not the point. According to the most popular version of the story, Keenan walked into the locker room before the first game that the alternates were to be worn, and erupted, stating quite loudly that they looked like garbage and would never go on the ice. And a hasty switch was made, and the team wore their regular jerseys onto the ice while the alternates were sent elsewhere, presumably to either the bowels of the arena or to a dumpster. It's a popular story, one that's become accepted as fact, but is it true? The Blues had a promising but unfulfilled start to the 1990s. Players like Brett Hall, Adam Oates, and for one season, Scott Stevens were in their prime, but the team was still unable to make it past the second round. Trades and changes were made, but after an embarrassing first round sweep at the hands of the Dallas Stars in 1994, it was clear a major change needed to be made. One could possibly conjure up a dozen adjectives to describe Mike Keenan, who was the toast of New York in June 1994 after leading the Rangers to their first Stanley Cup in 54 years. Keenan was described as everything from bombastic to surly, hey, surly only looks out for one guy, surly, to belligerent, to irascible, to explosive, and several words in between. The Rangers' triumph barely covered the acrimony taking place behind the scenes in New York, which involved Keenan openly feuding with GM Neil Smith all season and reportedly plotting an exit strategy during the playoffs, including reports that either Keenan or his agent had initiated contact and contract talks with other NHL teams during the playoffs. To make a long story short, in June 1994, Keenan had just finished taking the chronologically underachieving, mentally soft Rangers to their greatest triumph since before Pearl Harbor. And then, in truly stunning fashion, it happened. Keenan quit. Keenan claimed the Rangers were in breach of contract, accusing the team of not issuing a bonus check within the specified 30 days at the end of the season. If the team was in breach, this allowed Keenan's contract to be void allowing the coach to become a free agent. The 1990s was a huge era of contract holdouts in the NHL, and Keenan was no stranger. After rumors that he would take over as GM and coach for the Detroit Red Wings, 
he would do so for the St. Louis Blues. This was nothing new for St. Louis. In 1990, they signed Scott Stevens to an offer sheet, and when Washington declined to match, gave up five first-round picks, one of whom was Sergei Gonchar. In 1991, they signed Michel Goulet to an offer sheet, only to be matched by the Chicago Blackhawks. The same year, they signed Brendan Shanahan to an offer sheet, and after the New Jersey Devils rejected their compensation, had to go to arbitration, and give up Scott Stevens. The same year, a war of offer sheets with the Bruins was settled in a three-player, two-pick trade. In 1993, they signed Marty McSorley to an offer sheet, matched by the Kings. In 1994, they signed Canucks forward Peter Nedved to an offer sheet. When Vancouver declined to match, they were awarded Craig Janney and a second round pick as compensation, only for Janney to refuse to report and be traded back to St. Louis in a multiplayer deal. And finally, that same year, they signed Scott Stevens to an offer sheet, only for, you guessed it, the New Jersey Devils to match and end up in a first round compensation that would become Zach Parise. Now, St. Louis was making Keenan their GM and head coach, despite already having a GM and a head coach. Coming off a of Stanley Cup, Keenan was the most valuable non-player in hockey. Even Detroit, who had Scotty Bowman coaching, had tried to get him. Eventually, the NHL ruled that the Blues could sign Keenan, charging him $700,000 and suspending him for 60 days. The Blues also sent Peter Nedved to the Rangers for Essa Tikkanen and Dud Lidster, which according to Rangers president Bob Gutkowski could not have been made under any other circumstances. In a news conference that announced his hiring, Keaton said, We all achieved the objective we set out to achieve. And that's for me to be the general manager and coach of the St. Louis Blues. Jack Quinn, the president of the Blues, said, We got the finest coach in hockey. I'm Tony Twist, St. Louis Blues. I'm going to give you a tour of the Kiel Center. Come on in. This is uh, the trainer's room. This is where you ask your trainers if you need something, and they'll get it to you about a week or two weeks later. Okay, hey, let's go back down. Hey, don't hit me with that. The Blues had just moved into the new Kiel Center after almost 30 years at the old St. Louis Arena. Coming with Keenan were a set of new uniforms, featuring a predominant use of red and a shoulder logo for the first time. According to team chairman Mike Shanahan, we are moving into a new building, we are moving into the 1990s. This is the time to redesign the uniform. The new sweaters came from a 12-month collaboration between Blues officials and Ed O'Hara and Shawn Michael Edwards a design firm in New York City. In the first year, the Blues would finish third in the Western Conference, shortened due to the lockout. They would face the weaker Vancouver Canucks, who Keenan had beat the year before, but would be bounced in seven games. While the Blues seemed to be headed for the right direction, a feud between Keenan and star winger Brendan Shanahan developed, after the latter had injured his ankle at final game. But otherwise, the Blues seemed to be headed for the right direction. However, that summer, Keenan would make a whirlwind of changes. He began by signing goalie Grant Fuhr, former Ranger Brian Noonan, and eventually Dale Howarchuk, letting go Bill Holder and Todd Ellick. Ellick had finally established himself as a top six forward the past two seasons, especially during the 1995 playoffs, while Howarchuk was three years older and had missed half the season. But that's just the signings. The day after losing Holder, Keenan traded Shanahan to the Hartford Whalers for Chris Pronger. Defenseman Doug Lidster was sent to the Rangers for Jay Wells. And in a trademark St. Louis move, Shane Corson was signed to, you guessed it, an offer sheet. And the Blues sent two first round picks to the Oilers in compensation. Only for the picks to be sent back in return for prospect Mike Greer and Curtis Joseph. The same day, the outstanding Steve Duchesne was traded to Ottawa for a second round pick. The Shanahan for Prongu trade was a stunner. In the 1992-93 and 1993-94 seasons, Shanahan had scored 103 goals and 196 points. He was regarded as one of the best, if not the best, power forwards in the NHL. You gonna be alright tomorrow, Shanny? Oh yeah. 1994-95 saw him slump 20 goals and 41 points in 45 games. 
He'd missed the first three games of the shortened season with mono and struggled as his father fought a losing battle against Alzheimer's. The line of Shanahan, Craig Janney, and Brett Hall was one of the league's best, but Keenan couldn't stand Janney and traded him to San Jose after just eight games. This left a gaping hole up the middle, which forced Ian LaPerriere or Adam Creighton into the middle of the top line. Pronger, meanwhile, was 20 years old, had two NHL seasons, and had already generated significant questions about his passion, his work ethic, and his judgment, both on and off the ice. He was regarded as a franchise caliber defenseman, but there were absolutely questions about whether that would ever happen. In the meantime, Shanahan was 26 years old and just entering his prime years, which was frightening considering how well he played to that point in his career. Lidster for Wells was something of a lateral move. Duchesne for a draft pick was baffling. It saw one of the league's best offensive defensemen and one of the best power play defensemen sent packing for no help on the roster. In the preceding three seasons, Duchesne had scored 44 goals and 151 points in 165 games. He had just turned 30 years old and looked to have a lot of high-level hockey left in him. Possibly the worst of all was the course in signing and the resulting trade of Joseph and Greer. Joseph was 28 years old and one of the best goalies in the NHL. Greer was 20 and had just finished up a monster season in college with Boston University, including 29 goals and 55 points and a nod as a first team All-American. Corson could produce, but more often than not his pension for undisciplined play made him a non-factor. He'd been involved in several incidents both on and off the ice and in the just completed 1994-95 season, He'd been stripped of the Oilers' captaincy after an incident involving a teammate that allegedly began with a course in eruption over him not being awarded a secondary assist in a game that the Oilers lost by five goals. This also wasn't his first major incident with the Oilers. In the span of one offseason, the Blues had lost Curtis Joseph, Brendan Shanahan, Steve Duchesne, Mike Greer, Doug Lidster, Bill Holder, and Todd Elliott. In their place were Grant Fuhr, who had just played 49 games the previous two seasons, most of them poor outings, a young Chris Pronger, Brian Noonan, Jay Wells, Shane Corson, and Dale Howarchuk. Add in the Janney for Jeff Norton trade and the Blues had very quickly gone from one of the best and most promising young teams into something. The backlash was swift. The post-dispatch asked, is Keenan acting in his personal, not their professional interests? Is he purging fan favorites? Is his ego such that he wants the team's pedestal for himself? Is Captain Brett Hall next? Keenan had joined St. Louis and promised change. He had made multiple moves in 1994, all great hockey moves, but most of the team was inherited. It had not entered the man's mind that maybe this team did not need change. Regardless of what Pronger would eventually become, the simple fact is that in 1995, neither one of Pronger or Carson carried anywhere close to the trade value of Joseph or Shanahan. To trade Shanahan, the ultimate heart and soul player, with an incredible production on the ice, for a promising defenseman who had shown little in two seasons and didn't particularly seem to care whether he got better or not, was a foolish deal right from the beginning. And, to trade, in a roundabout way, Joseph for Corson, one of the best goalies in the NHL for one of the league's most frustrating players at the time, was even worse. The fanbase had a tough time buying in for the start of the 1995-96 season. Fan favorites were gone, replaced by either unrealized potential, like Pronger, or free agent ringers. Several of the newcomers arrived for training camp out of shape. The new Kiel Center was not sold out for the season opener and several writers pointed out that the electricity normally present for such a game was noticeably absent. The most obvious reaction was when Keenan was introduced for the game to a hearty round of boos. After the 8th game, a listless loss against Buffalo that dropped the Blues to 3 wins, 4 losses and 1 tie, Keenan publicly questioned the work ethic and effort of Brett Hall. Dale Howarchuk and Jeff Norton. Keenan had acquired the latter two, and both were scratched for the game in question. Hole would respond publicly as well, and Keenan would strip Hole 
of the captaincy. Off to a great start. Eight games into the season. The tension ramped up in the new year, with Keenan describing the team as disappointing and troubling, extremely inconsistent, and a difficult group to read. Hull responded, he's blaming everyone else again, walking away from the reporters. He would add, that's two guys. There were 18 other ones. That's like saying you're not responsible for your stepkids if you get remarried. Two weeks later, Hull would play on a line with Wayne Gretzky at the 1996 All-Star Game. This ramped up rumors that the Blues were pursuing Gretzky, finally resulting in the arrival of the Great One that February. The Blues were two games over .500 at that point, and despite a small decline, would make the playoffs anyway. Their first round against Toronto saw disaster strike when Fuhr would go down with an ACL tier the second game. Coming in was John Casey, who against all odds would carry the team to six games. Facing them in the second round was the Detroit Red Wings, who were the regular season champions. The series would be even, going to seven games. The game would see a goaltender battle between Casey and Chris Osgood, with neither team managing to score until... Gretzky had it, lost it, Eisenman picks it up. Eisenman moving, blue line chance, Stop! One of the most chaotic seasons in NHL history had ended. Despite all the turmoil, the future looked bright, except they bungled the Gretzky negotiations and he signs with the Rangers. A ton of money was thrown at aging players, the team wasn't producing, and fans were upset. The bad uniforms, the sterile atmosphere at a new arena, a front office that ignored what fans wanted, and a GM and coach whose moods shifted hourly stole all the attention. 3,000 seats were left vacant for the 1996-97 season opener, and the uniforms they wore, known as quote, clown suits, were a fitting metaphor for what the franchise had become. An offer by the front office to season ticket holders did no impact, when the free tickets that they offered were to games where the Blues either played weaker teams or on weekdays. But on the other hand, there was exciting news on the Jersey front to report. It was announced in late October that St. Louis would be rolling out an alternate jersey with a stylized version of the trumpet patch on the shoulders. As was standard with alternates at the time, they were scheduled to hit the ice after the All-Star break in January 1997. This didn't help the team's fortunes on the ice, as they continued to flounder around .500. The circus continued, and then an announcement came down in mid-December 1996 as the axe fell. Both Keenan and President Jack Quinn were gone, replacing Quinn was former St. Louis Cardinals and Pittsburgh Pirates CEO Mark Sawyer. A month later, a press release came out before the All-Star break, detailing the upcoming alternate jerseys. St. Louis was no longer mentioned. Remember, the story that's been shared as common knowledge for the last decade or longer is that Keenan walked into the Blues locker room, saw the jerseys, blew up, and said that no team of his would ever wear something so hideous, and the entire set of jerseys was quickly changed. In October, St. Louis announced that they would be unveiling an alternate jersey. In December, Mike Keenan and Jack Quinn are both fired. In January, a new report comes out, omitting St. Louis from the list. This means Keenan could not have had that pregame blow up in the locker room. The alternate jerseys were first worn after the All-Star game, since Fox started broadcasting NHL games on the weekends then. They weren't worn exclusively on weekend dates, but they wouldn't hit the ice until after the All-Star game, period. If the Keenan story were to be true, the jerseys would have to be ready by Christmas 1996. And as unpopular as Keenan was, there would be no way a story about Keenan throwing a tantrum before a game would fly under the radar. The fact that there's a story about Keenan throwing a tantrum about the length of the visiting team's bench that month makes it obvious a story about Keenan refusing to let his team wear those jerseys would without a doubt be headlines. 
Instead, there is nothing. What we have is a jersey that simply mysteriously vanished, and a team that quietly withdrew from the alternate jersey program for 1996-97, with nothing being said publicly. The media is strangely silent on this matter as well. Regardless, a complete house cleaning at the top was underway, and the biggest change was right around the corner. Everyone knows the fans are in charge. So when they wanted some changes here at the Keel Center this past summer, management listened. Let's go inside and talk to Blues Vice President of Marketing and Communications, Jim Woodcock. All right, Woody, we're inside the new Keel Center, and the first thing that sticks out to me, everything's blue. And that's what our fans wanted, and uh, when uh, the new regime of the Blues came here a couple of months ago, uh, we looked around and said, you know, this building isn't ours. It's, uh, it's an entertainment palace, and I think our fans want a building that they feel is theirs, and frankly, our players wanted a building that they felt comfortable calling theirs and calling, calling home. Woody, so many changes. Uh, take us on a tour through the building here. In either late January or early February 1997, Jim Woodcock was named Senior VP of Marketing and Communications. Woodcock immediately leapt into action. As a lifelong Blues fan, he was too familiar with the new Kiel Center and its magenta seats. And with Keenan gone, a chance to completely overhaul things for a team that had become alienated with its own fan base so rapidly. The following season would see the pre-game laser show and the raspberry seats gone. The biggest change would be the introduction of a new, classic blues jersey, featuring a redesigned classic logo. A blue version would be unveiled the following year, seeing the clown suits retired for good. During this time, the blues began to improve, and while Brett Hull would leave for the Dallas Stars in 1998, a young core led by Chris Pronger would see the team into the 2000s. So what happened to the trumpet? In an article way up at the top when the white alternate hit the ice in 1997, there was a snippet that said, the old ones were the brainchild of former Blues president Jack Quinn. To hear the Blues, the old duds could not have been worse, unless Quinn had replaced the blue note with a trumpet as threatened. What we do know is that Keenan was hired in July 1994 after the, quote, clown suits were unveiled to a skeptical public. So he had nothing to do with that particular decision. Considering the long lead time associated with designing a jersey, which involves input from multiple parties, it's very likely that the process of actually designing the trumpet alternate began in late 1995. This process could have involved heavy input from the team or it could have been as simple as telling the designer or a design group just to come up with something. The overnight success of the San Jose Sharks logo and jersey before they even played a game convinced a lot of teams to go forward with overhauling their own marketing and merchandising. The downfall of the major players involved in the marketing and promoting the Blues was swift. But there is a possible answer. Custom Crafted, based in Massachusetts, did jersey customization for several NHL teams during the 1990s. Long story short, team receives blank jerseys from the manufacturer, team sends them to another place along with copies of the roster to have all names and numbers added. Other place sends them back to team, team issues them to players to wear on the ice. Custom Crafted did names and numbers for Boston, Hartford, New Jersey, and St. Louis. Therefore, if anyone knows how far this process actually went, it's Custom Crafted. Custom Crafted's response can be summed up briefly. No jerseys were ever produced. In other words, there is no way Mike Keenan rejected the jerseys. According to Custom Crafted, the jerseys even lacked a spec sheet, which involves what the uniforms would look like on ice and all graphics. No fonts were ever made for the jersey. Was Mike Keenan the one who squashed the jersey? It's likely he never even saw it. But what about the screenshot that started it all? This and many other seen blues prototypes come from a book called Note by Note which celebrated the Blues' 35th anniversary and was published in 2002, written by Jim Woodcock. The book is the source of the Keenan story. The giveaway that the story might not be true is that the date is listed as Spring 1996. As we've already established, 
The jersey was to be worn in 1996, 97. Meaning one of a few things. It's entirely likely that Woodcock either got the date wrong, it's also likely that the date is for when the jersey was originally pitched. Either case still means Keenan didn't have a screaming decathlon in the Blues locker room, as the jerseys were never mass produced. A lot of work goes into designing, approving, and mass producing jerseys that unless they were vetoed early in the process, could not be rejected by one person. There is no way, especially the day the team was going to wear them, a jersey was going to be quietly thrown away, especially after it would likely be mass produced and in team stores. The New York Islanders released their fisherman jerseys to astounding anger, and it took the team three seasons before they were finally back to their original colors, a decision that was made nearly right away. What happened was simply a regime change that saw the people responsible for the Blues trumpet jerseys ousted in favor of those who wanted a more classic look. In the almost 25 years, the Blues have retained that 1997 look, eventually winning their first cup in 2019 wearing a variation of that jersey. The following year saw the quote, clown suits return as throwback jerseys. In 2021, the Blues would debut another jersey based off the quote, clown jerseys. Keenan would go on to Vancouver, where he is very loved by all fans and players. Reflecting back on the dizzying experience, Woodcock puts it best. Above all, the blue note was restored, and it's the same one the team wears and uses today and if nothing else, I'm very proud of that.